This is Andy Gutierrez from StarWars.com, and you are listening to Coffee with Kenobi with Dan Z. This is the podcast you're looking for. This is Vanessa Marshall, Harrison Dula from Star Wars Rebels, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi. Joining us today for a cup of coffee, adventurers, it's time to talk about the newest and final film of Harrison Ford as Indiana Jones. We are talking about Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. At the time of this recording, we have all seen the movie the first day it came out. It's it's scheduled to come out June 30th, but we are recording this on June 29th. We have not talked about it at all. So we're going to just dump right in. First, let's bring in uh, the co-host for tonight. First, Mr. Tom Gross. Hello, everybody. It's great to be here. And oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, am I excited to talk about Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. Yeah, you and I saw this together. And then afterwards, our friend uh, Scott and then was like, well, what do you guys think? And we just kind of looked at each other and with <laughs> poker faces and Mason's like, well, I'm not going to talk about it yet either. Uh, and so we just all kept straight face. We don't know. We also don't know. Now he saw at the same time as us, but in a different part of the of the continental United States. So we followed our red line of travel across the map, <laughs> landed on Tennessee, uh, where we find our other co-host, the co-creator of Coffee with Kenobi, Corey Club. Hey, hey, I'm ready for this adventure for sure. Oh, good deal, good deal. So we are we're gonna talk about this. We're gonna do what we always do. Uh quite honestly, this could this is something that well, we're just gonna jump. We're gonna do one word and overall thoughts on the movie uh who wants to go first <laughs> uh, what the heck i'll go first all right all right so this i knew i i knew about the one word and I, i've been stressing about it and i have about six of them and i think this is the one i landed on it's i don't know that it's my favorite but i'm gonna go with it because it's how i feel and how i felt nostalgic is my word and my initial so initial impression we want um so my initial impression as as i walked out of the theater this this had everything that i've come to and expect from an indiana jones movie it had great action great chases an intimidating villain great historical fiction artifacts a touch of magic and quite frankly Indiana Jones of old, hence my nostalgia word. Okay. Uh, Corey? You know, I have not talked to Tom about this movie at all until the, until the time of this recording. And I know we were just kind of getting set up for this show and uh, had a quick little break. And I walked out to our boys and I said, hey, we're recording for the new, the new movie. We just saw it. And I asked them their one words. I told them my one word. And... Uh, it's exactly the same word Tom used. Nostalgic. <laughs> uh, that's what I like. You said it's not exactly my favorite, but I I, I feel like it's a, a worthy uh, choice, um, because uh, this movie, it's, and it's still sinking in for me now, even still, because I only saw it a few hours ago, so um, I'm still kind of reeling from it. Um, this had every touch of Indiana Jones in it. This is an on-screen hero that had a send-off that was worthy of him, an adventure that was thrilling, uh, a cast of characters that was uh, fantastic, a vi- like you said, a villain that was really was bad, a, a bad dude, like got the job done. He, he knew what he was going after. Um, and just an overall just adventure, just an adventure. Uh we went to some places we never did been before with Indiana Jones, and that was fantastic. Um, now, granted, I do have a little bit of some low lights that well, I'm sure we'll get into, but uh, overall, I thought it was fantastic. It was just a great time to be at the movies again. And I was talking and thinking about this before we left for the movie with my wife, Holly. I kind of said I'm excited to go see this movie because it's not a Marvel movie. It's not a superhero movie. It's just a, a, a cinema picture that that is, an, a, you know, featuring a character that's one of my favorite of all time. So how can I not like it going in, you know? Um, And similar to, you know, uh, the recent Top Gun Maverick that was like, I can go in, I can see this movie and and know I'm getting 
what I paid for uh, and, and enjoying it for what it is. But this even topped that for me um, for this movie. And uh, it was great to see Harrison Ford again. He is uh, still at the top of his game. I think he always will be. Uh, and just in, enjoying him playing this character um, for this turn uh, and his adventure. Huh. I, w- I didn't know what you two were going to say. Uh, I'm not sure if you know what I'm going to say. I don't. My word <laughs> to describe this, is, uh, one word to describe Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, my word would be complicated. Uh. My feelings on this film are complicated. I think this film in many ways tries to do some really complicated things. I think this film uh, shares a conflicted, complicated hero that is unlike any version of Indiana Jones we've ever seen before. And I think there are several reasons for that, which we are going to get into, but I, I completely agree with you that Harrison Ford is at the top of his game. You know, I, uh, like the two of you, I've got a, a massive man crush on Harrison Ford. I just <laughs> love him so much. Uh, and in many ways, I the reason as complicated is as I ran into a couple of things uh, that I know better that I that I just sort of fell into those trappings anyway. But we'll get into that. Let, let's mm-hmm. talk about the film itself. Uh, Let's talk about the beginning sequence. It's, of course, extremely CGI heavy in this. We go back in time in Harrison Ford. At first, I thought he, Indiana Jones, I thought he was a spy. Now, he was spying, but he was he was in infiltrating a Nazi base as an archaeologist, not as a member of the army. Now, in Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, which Corey and I, you were, uh, yeah. reviewed last week with Jeff McGee, uh, they talked about Indiana Jones being in the military, winning several medals. Uh, so that's what I thought we were getting at first. But what did the two of you think about this opening sequence uh, with a younger Indiana Jones? You know, I, I knew this going in from the just from the trailer alone. They kind of showed a quick glimpse of him being unmasked when or unhooded from being captured and get this quick look of a younger Indiana, Indiana Jones. And um, I really believe... Lucasfilm is always trying to push that envelope of what they can do uh, with technology. Uh, and it's evident in all, it's all over their films throughout uh, star Wars and, and all over the place. And just being able to experiment and dabble in that arena is always been fascinating to me because sometimes it really pulled off and I can't tell. Uh, and there's sometimes where it's like, what is going on here? This is like <laughs> pretty bad. And, you know, a lot of movies use this kind of stuff. Uh, we, I most recently saw the most recent Flash movie that used CGI that was, like, really pretty bad uh, in some respects. But this, I think they're going for that realism look, that uh, that overall effect. And it didn't take me out of the movie, uh, but I could see the the googly eyes a little bit sometimes. And, and the lighting was just, just right where you could kind of feel like, okay, this doesn't feel just as right. But, again, like, I enjoyed the younger adventure. Uh, I like that it kicked it off with a, a good, almost like 20 minutes uh, of a brand new adventure, uh, kind of setting the storyline, setting the characters, um, and just seeing a young Indiana Jones run around and do his thing. Uh, it was great. Um, I'm glad they included it. I'm glad it wasn't, you know, oh, it wasn't as, as perfect as it can be. But again, like, I'm okay with that. Like, it lends the story. And again, it kicks off in a way that is authentic Indiana Jones out there looking for the next treasure, looking to get it, put it in a museum and fighting Nazis. Like that's, I could watch that all day uh, uh, for Indiana Jones nostalgia and, and being a part of this. So I think it was a great introduction. And as the title card came up, uh, I was just like a big smile on my face. That, that script, that font that it's in, it's the one they mm-hmm. use in everyone. I'm so glad they used that again too. It, it just, the tone of it as well felt old and musky and kind of dirty and, and as as it should. And I just felt like I was back in the movie theater watching Indiana Jones all over again. So I think they accomplished a lot here with this sequence. That's cool. Tom? Wow. <laughs> you gave a lot there, Corey. Sorry. Um, yeah, no, this train scene was was out of this world. And you know what? The only problem with the CGI was me. I pulled myself out going, wait a minute, 
that's not <laughs> that. No, that, you know, and, and it was my fault because once I got over that, I didn't, I didn't think about it again. And so I just, I, it, it, that I, I, I'm with you, Corey, this, this opening is one of my favorite parts of the movie. When I when I sat back on my drive uh, after watching the movie, you know, your, your head is swimming. And I don't know about you guys, but my brain right after watching a movie is just like, what did I just see? What did I just see? What are the things? <laughs> and you're like, I'm trying to replay it all in my head. And the first thing and, the, and repeatedly came back to that opening sequence. I just think there's so many cool things about it. it. First of all, when we talk about nostalgic, it, it reminded me of the opening of all of the movies. You know, they stuck to that. They stuck to that script because it works. And I was in it 100%. I loved the little bit where they do the switcheroo of what artifact they're looking for. You mm -hmm. know, they're looking for the, the dagger or the knife. And then yeah. it turns out to be a fake and you're like, Ooh, this is different. But yeah. then the, then the actual, not the actual, but the, a real artifact is on that train, which I thought that was really cool. Um, and then he uses, doesn't he use the, the, the fake one to in some way jam the door. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> which I thought was marvelous, but look at all of the different scenes of that opening train sequence they were in an office. They were in a car to car chase. They were in an artifact search on one of the cars. There was a, a dining uh, car, which Tan, I was sitting next to your friend, Scott. And when, when they walked in there, both Scott and I were like, Oh boy, here we go. <laughs> yeah. I thought there was going to be a lot more shenanigans on that one. Um, but still, and then, and then they're on top of the train and they're on the side of the train and they're, I mean, they used the, they used every ounce. Oh, the, the gun car. Yeah. I mean, for heaven's sakes, <laughs> yeah. they used every ounce of that train to make that sequence just spectacular and fresh. I was, I was sold. And I, and once I got over my own problem, not problem, but my own curiosity of CGI, I didn't think a thing of it after that. I wish I had that feeling that so the opening of this for, for one thing, this is yet another example. That I, I, I apparently had to learn this lesson repeatedly in my in my older life. I should never watch trailers because imagine the feeling you would have had if they take that mask off. And not only is it Indiana Jones, which you know it's going to be, but it's a younger Harrison Ford. It would have right. been such a great thrill. So I, I'm mad mm -hmm. that I cheated myself out of that. I don't blame marketing for that because that's their job. It's I mean, I could have shut my eyes. I mean, don't we know from Indiana Jones you can't, you got to keep your eyes shut when they open up the arc. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, the googly eyes is apt. I found the, it seemed like the lighting was purposely created to show you, Hey, look, doesn't that look like Harrison Ford when he was younger? Mm -hmm. But what took it out from him besides for the most part, it was amazing. And I, and my, and I, and I'll be honest, I get really annoyed when people criticize uh, CGI heavy. I, I find it to be lazy after a while. Uh, because I can't do it. I The people who are doing it are geniuses. Uh, but it doesn't mean they're infallible, right? I mean, what they did was great. And I agree with you, Corey, the, the CGI on Flash was problematic. But there was a lot about the Flash that was problematic. But we can get to that on maybe a future pro or something. Yeah. Uh, for this one, sometimes Harrison's eyes looked a little bit like the kids in uh, the Polar Express. And that and that freaked me out a little bit. They they seem kind of dead. Harrison Ford's eyes are so expressive; they're so vibrant and uh, full of passion and spirit. And that was missing. And but even more than that, what took me out a little, just a little bit, but enough to distract me, was that Harrison's voice was not de-aged. Mark Hamill's voice is de-aged in The Mandalorian and The Book of Boba Fett. But Harrison Ford's voice sounded like an older Harrison Ford, like the one in this movie that uh, was near 80 when they filmed this. It didn't sound like a younger Harrison Ford to me. And I noticed it throughout the entire 20 minutes, however long it was. And that was problematic for me. Even the way that he moved sometimes felt a little bit robotic and not like a natural. And it made me wonder if like, was it like a stunt man and they kept trying to CGI Harrison's like posture on? I, I don't really know. I'd love to see a making of thing. 
Yeah. All that being said, the reason this is complicated for me is there have been the three times in my life where I would go to see a movie and I would try to just go in and not make a big deal out of it. But inside, like my stomach was a mess. Like Tom, I don't know if you could tell, but I was a nervous wreck before we saw this movie. <laughs> yes. An absolute wreck. I was so nervous about seeing it. And when I woke up, I'm like, oh wait, there's new Indiana Jones movie. Oh, that's cool. Hey, what am I gonna have for breakfast? But it's a big <laughs> deal. I was trying to underplay it in my mind, but it's a massive deal. This is my favorite yeah. fictional character besides Spider-Man. And it's Harrison Ford. So it was such a big deal for me. Before I saw The Phantom Menace, before I saw The Force Awakens, and before I saw this movie, um, this was probably the least degree of the for, of those three examples. So I, I had so much in my head that I wanted to feel instead of just taking it for what it was. So that is completely, completely on me, and I own all of that. I was not able to take myself out of that. I thought the action was great. I thought... The fact that, oh, by the way, the Dial of Destiny is on here. Uh, I thought that was the reason that threw me was because uh, the main villain, who, who played masterfully by Mads Mikkelsen, mm. whose his character name escapes me, uh, the fact that did he always know that it was on there too and it was a ruse that he was looking for, the, the blade that cuts Christ uh, or not? Or was it just sort of convenient, like, let's just switch gears here? I don't know. I'm, I'm being overly critical uh, and I don't want to be because I, I liked his interplay with um, uh, with Zoloff from the Captain America film. Oh, uh, that, that was, uh, yeah, that Toby was, Jones. Um, yeah, that was the. Oh, he that's was the, who that was. Yeah. <laughs> so that I I I, I need to I just I, I want to do a show in the future where I, after I've seen this movie a second time because I feel like seeing hmm. it a second time will will benefit from it. So I I enjoyed the opening. It was cool, but I had a hard time. Uh, with the verisimil too, because I, I I kept thinking this doesn't sound like a young Harrison, and well I know it's supposed to be the action is fun. I miss the expressiveness of Harrison Ford's eyes, and it, and that it was problematic for me. So I agree with you. I want to see a behind the scenes how they they did that with was it a stunt double that like you know had his face on? Was it actually Harrison Ford dubbing into it? Like you know we saw Mark Hamill do. Uh, I, I did feel his voice was a little younger. I, it didn't really track with me. It didn't really change. So it wasn't as gravelly, I guess. Um, but uh, I, I thought I it was better in the other flashback, by the way, when he goes into his friend's apartment and he meets. Um, oh, when they had the flashback of. What the yeah, was when he was a little bit older, he had grayish hair. I thought I thought that CGI and that voice work mm. was was seamless. I thought that was terrific. Yeah, it's it's that's true, and it, it, you'd think they would do a better job because there was so much like uh, darkness and light, and they had some a couple of scenes where he was mm. when he was driving the car uh, with the Germans in the back, there like it was like a stripe of white over mm. his eyes, where you know mm. showing like kind of that that some felt artificial. Invaders. Yeah, it felt weird, like it, 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 unnatural, and his helmet felt weird sitting on his head. Like I, I've seen it done better, but then again, like I, I just don't know what place they're coming at with this. So. Um, I'm glad they did it though. I don't, I'm glad they didn't just cut it out and say, oh, oh we're too. not going to try this. So, you know what I wish would have happened? Uh, you know, the beginning of Last Crusade, uh, when we had a very, younger, very young yeah. River Phoenix mm-hmm, mm-hmm, as yeah. Harrison, as Her- Indiana Jones. I love that. That's one of my favorite sequences. Why? This would have been a perfect time to introduce a new actor to keep the Indiana Jones franchise going. And he could have been that. And there could have been a nice transition into an older Harrison Ford. <laughs> That would have been great. I mean, I'm not, you know, Let's re- reboot a young Indiana Jones series or something. Something mm. that would have been. Yeah, this would have been a cool great. time. Cool way to well, do. I think they're trying to keep him age worthy. Uh, yeah, and I'm glad. I'm sense. grateful for that. But it's, yeah. I don't know. I feel like my my wide eyed childhood came back, and I didn't. I didn't see any of that stuff. I wish. I wish <laughs> I felt I, that way. I, I'm hoping a second film will do that. You know, I was Dan, so into it. I want to address what your reservations just going into the film and the anxiety of going into the film. I think there's so much, and we talked about this with Crystal Skull, like there's so much knowing as older adults uh, that we're still just crazy, crazy eyes for India Jones and just mm-hmm. these franchises that we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to be like, this, this is going to be amazing. I want this to be amazing. I want to be able to fill these fields. I want to be able to do all these things, but we've been tainted by, um, you know, a lot of different movies um, mm-hmm. over the years. And we're, we're older, we're wiser. We know more about how films are made. 
what what works, what doesn't work. And this is all pressing against this film. Like, you know, we know that this is possibly his last outing as Indiana Jones. Oh, it totally is. Yeah. I mean, I mean, yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm not, I guess I'm in the sense of like, we just know that like we want this to be the movie that, that, that brings us nostalgia and also gives us a send off. And it's, that's a heavy load. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I had read somewhere that I think the director, uh, James Mangold said, this is his love letter to Indiana Jones. Mm-hmm. And it certainly feels that way. I feel it's more of a love letter than it is. And it's like a send off. Cause I feel like it's like, he's still out there doing adventures. Uh, I always like to feel like that. He, we're just, we're just going to be with him just for a short time. So this one adventure and he, then he's off to the next thing. So I always feel like that's the case. And, um, this is really feels like, really feels like that for me, uh, with, you know, the way it works. I, I will say, I, I feel like I didn't think this would be a, a factor, but I feel like I missed Spielberg's vision. This is the first Indiana Jones film without Steven Spielberg behind the director's chair. I think James Mangold is a great director. I think he did a fabulous job juggling a lot. So this is not a knock on him. I think heart is here. I think there is a ton of heart in this movie. I got quite emotional at the end of this film. I feel like the spirit of what makes Indy tick is missing, but maybe that is on purpose because I think the majority of this movie is Indy trying to find himself through the loss of his family. I yep. find that to be pretty profound. I definitely will talk about that later. Uh, Tom, go ahead. No, I was just gonna. I was gonna expand upon that. Uh, that was a that was an aspect of the movie that I felt like made it very uh, a mature mm-hmm. Indiana Jones. We, you know, he hasn't had that aspect to his character in the past, mm-hmm. and those are probably the most striking moments of of the film for me. Uh, where it just kind of pulled at, at at the heartstrings, but what took that a step further, and I don't want to, I, I don't, I, just stop me if you, if you don't want me to hit this spot yet. But but when when they're leaving the boat, they escape, escape from the boat, and she she turns around and says something about wasn't that great, wasn't that blah blah blah, and he says, I just lost a friend. My friend was murdered. Yeah. To, to me, that yeah that. That in conjunction or in 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 together with his family losses just felt so powerful. And I and I, I really felt like I was witnessing a new motivation, a new internal like drive of Indiana Jones that that gave this movie life for me. So Tom, I am glad you brought that up. And I think that's part of my challenge. It's similar to what I had when I saw Into the Spider-Verse. I was not ready for the baton to be passed from Peter Parker to Miles Morales. And I think that is why I keep using Harrison Ford and Indiana Jones as synonyms, which isn't fair to them. Uh, well, the fictional characters matter because they're not real, but it isn't fair to Harrison. Uh, that I, I Maybe I'm just not ready for them to grow up uh, and mature in age and be vulnerable. And maybe that's just a hard reality that I think we all have to face. I'm probably overly complicating it and overly analyzing it, but that's, you know, sort of how I make my living in a lot of walks of life. I don't think so. Uh, You know, it's interesting that you bring up the aspect. You don't want it to to pass the baton with Peter to miles. And I I got over it. I ended up loving it and I didn't care, but it always takes me one viewing. This is Vanessa Marshall and you're listening to coffee with Kenobi. So that's interesting you bring that up because we were sitting there just before the movie started for Indiana Jones, and uh, my older son says, there's a lot of old people here. Uh, we didn't go to the matinee, uh, <laughs> so I wonder if that's the case, but uh, there was. There was, I mean, there was obviously some people in the audience with a half full and some, some kids and students there, and but majority were older crowd, um, but I felt that, uh, like, okay, well, this uh, this is the audience that knows Indiana Jones. They're looking forward to this film. They want to be part of his next adventure. And he's an old hero. He, he's from the 80s. And so, you know, this current generation didn't grow up with him. Um, they're they're not in line with, you know, feeling nostalgic feels of, of seeing that on VHS for the first time or something, mm-hmm. you know. And walking out of this movie, and just I'm going to comment too on Harrison Ford's age, 
he did fantastic, but he did. He just felt so old. I was Mm -hmm. like, man, he still got it. But yet he is, he's very old in this film. Um, And he's very self-aware of that fact. So I think that's the case too. Indy knows he's, he's retiring. He's older. He's what's he have to look forward to. Uh, He's separated from Marion. I mean, he's lost his son to, to war. He's made mistakes. It sounds like he doesn't go on adventures anymore. He found Sala found his his hat and whip under his bed. What's he living for? Is it retirement? Is it is it a, the next nap? So there's a little moody and somberness to him in his in this film, and it, it plays out in Harrison Ford's portrayal. And yeah. I felt that coming out of this film, thinking like I felt old. I thought, man, I. I'm not super old, but like I, I do, I, I, this is the last time we'll see him on film mm-hmm. uh, in theaters. And this is a, a passing of the guard, if you will. You know, this is, this is a, an era that is being, you know, crossed out. Uh, no, I should say crossed out. This is an era that's moving on. You know, it, it's, it's right. an era. Mm-hmm. So that's and why it, I think this film comes in and, and d- fix makes you feel a little different. Cause you know, there's not gonna be a next one. That's no. And, and in many ways, you know, that is when you first see him, like even in Crystal Skull, which we talked about last week, he was yeah. 65 when he made that movie. And while they acknowledge his age once or twice, it was not a factor in the action. It was not a right. factor in any aspect of that story at all. He just powered through and he's just amazing. And here he does that. And he's still almost limitless in his energy and his, his passion and his inventiveness uh, but it's it's weird for me to see my heroes vulnerable. And I think if I'm being honest, and I am being very honest because I'm with my friends here on Coffee with Kenobi, it's hard for me to see him uh, being jar- jostled uh, uh, out of sleeping in his recliner with the TV <laughs> still on. He, he drinks uh, quite a bit. You know, and they don't make him an alcoholic, but there's certainly implications that he drinks more than he has. Um, he's walking around, you know, shirtless in his boxers, and he barely puts on a shirt. And did I see it was a Cubs logo on? He's a Cubs fan. Yes, yeah. sir. yes. Well, he did go to the University of Chicago, so that was, of course, the greatest <laughs> thing ever. That was great. Uh, yeah, uh, but, but then he's backwards. like, he's banging, <laughs> complaining to his neighbors. He just, he just doesn't look heroic or noble like uh, the night that uh, finds like, the cup my, of my Christ. Mom, that guy, keep right. It's, down. He's he's so he's so vulnerable and jaded. And even like the past 10 minutes of us talking about it, my my heart is growing for this film because uh, once I start accepting what they are trying to do, it it's easier to imp- to let go of what it didn't do, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it, when we're talking about the like the age and his separation from thing, you know, you go to, you know, a, a, a part of the original film, and I think it's I think it's replayed in some of the others, is his teaching. He could not relate to this class. Yeah, the, they were yep. bored. They were sleeping. Right. No one wanted to answer a question. Nobody was closing their eyelids that said "love you." There was <laughs> none of that. And so, even- uh, one more example of his separation. But you know, something about it that I I really appreciated was. I noted, I noted the crowd in our theater as well. Um, most of them. And, you know, when I say they're old, that's saying something coming from me, but I'm looking at them going, these people were probably 20 years plus mm-hmm. or 20 to 25 years old when they watched Indiana Jones and here they are, you know, our, our theater was probably mostly filled with people in their sixties. Mm-hmm. And so, one thing I appreciated about this movie is I, they did not have to shove it in my face. They did not have to keep making old person jokes. Yeah. There were really only one subtle moment when they're climbing the rocks yes. to, in the cave where, he, and it's not even a joke. He's more just like saying, I, I just don't yeah. have it. Any, you know, I just, yeah. just yes. go ahead of me. Yeah. I will catch up. That was really yeah. the only one. The only other things they needed to do is bring in the old, the, the characters uh, from the f- past movies to make me realize that time has passed. That's these bad. men, uh, you know, these men are still wanting the adventure, but it, it just, it, it isn't, it isn't quite there yet, but Indy definitely 
Indy makes it makes it work. And and I just I I really appreciated that that I did note they it, it was very definite that that time has passed, but it did not it it did not like ruin the movie for me. No, it didn't it for ruin it for me at all. It was it was just very I I I really am appreciating again it with every passing moment of this conversation how introspective it is and honest that the moment with the rock that you brought up, says, yeah, I've been shot nine or 10 times. Yeah. I had to drink the blood of Kali. I wish yeah. you would have referenced uh last crusade and other stuff is mostly temple of doom there, but all, all of the Indian preceding and Jones films are at least acknowledged or referenced in some small way. Of course, the most beautiful with Raiders at the end, which we'll get to. So that, that part is really, really great. And the teacher thing is great too, which is another thing that's probably hitting me. Yeah. Uh, like he's, He's past his prime as a as a teacher. And part of him doesn't even care. He's using these overheads, which would have been cutting edge probably in, in 1969. <laughs> um, but but yeah, he's not into. He's just not into it, and they're not into him. And you know, I I feel that I'm certainly not there in my my career. Uh, but I, I I like that they did that. I like that they went there. This whole movie uh, again is really about him trying to bring himself back to life, but not really wanting to bring himself back to life. I, I, I think one of the genius things about this, and we'll just talk about it now. I really like that. We're just kind of talking about the psychology of this instead of just going beat by yeah. beat through plot details. I think it, I think this movie warrants this kind of a conversation. I like the fact that um, we see early on that Marion and Indy are getting a divorce and that broke my heart. I'm like, yeah, yeah. why can't Harrison Ford's, uh, beloved characters stay married. My gosh, you know, Harry, Han Solo, for lack of a better term, is is uh, an absentee father, a horrible yeah. father, and you know, just blah blah with Han Solo. Um, that, that just frustrated me that plot device, but it but it worked out. For this one, we find out yes, Marion's grief was so heavy, um, and he just couldn't pull her out of it. But at the end, when Marion says to him, "Are you back?" like it was we learned it wasn't one-sided grief we yes. learned that this man's complicated extensive exhaustive grief left him a shell of himself he couldn't be uh who marion needed he couldn't be who he needed hmm. because of the loss of their son uh and because of the loss of of what he valued in his life and uh when you see the end of crystal skull how happy he is oh my yeah. gosh i mean that that was as real of an emotion as you're going to feel uh, in a fictional story. I think that uh, that's fantasy based that I think I could possibly fathom. You know, uh, you mentioned him, you know, kind of waking up and I, the moment that caught me that I felt like he was kind of just going through life. He was on the train going, you know, to his job. He was retiring the, the little party in the office there. He, the class was really just kind of droning on he meets, he meets uh, Helena, and or Helena. I don't know how to say that, but uh, Helena, I think, is right. Helena um, is, is goddaughter, um, and he mm -hmm. kind of sparks the life, and she kind of tried to pump him into this adventure. They share a moment in the, uh, the kind of the archives there in the, at the school, and and they separate because she's she's stealing this from him, this this piece of the a dial of destiny, um, and there's a scene where the villains kill these these faculty members. And I was shocked at that and the fact that like, wow, they, they're doing this. Those, these are two innocent people. And Indiana Jones, he, Jones finds them and, and he's struck with grief instantly. Uh, these are colleagues. These are people. And he goes to answer the phone. He's, and he looks, he's shocked in blood. Like he's snapped to life a little bit. Like what, what is happening? I'm getting wrapped up in this. I don't want to, I don't want to get wrapped up in this. I've already mentioned that, you know, in, the, in their conversation, but like now he's wanted for murder uh, in some regards and they're looking for him and, and it's, he's linked to this. Uh, and that's, that was a plot point that I was like, kind of like, wow, that, I didn't expect this. And kind of a shocker for me in the sense of he has a little loss and how he's losing more people, his friends, his colleagues. Uh, we said even further in, like you said, Tom, uh, his his, his uh, ben, uh, friend, the the captain of the ship, there, that, um, Antonio Banderas's character, I can't think of his name, but uh, it's that was shocking to me too. Uh, and it's it's, 
I don't know if that's the case for him. Just like I said, he's older and he's losing people around him. And he doesn't have anything left necessarily. And it's a, it's a sad interpretation, but I, I understand it. I, I get it. Uh, I make, make yeah, sense. no, it's, I think that's pretty brilliant because he, that, that when I watched the movie, while I was living that moment, I, I was struggle with those moments, but yeah. from another perspective, this is an action violence. This is cold blooded murder. Like these yeah. are assassinations. See, when every time these guys kill and they kill Andy's friend, uh, Antonio Banderas character, uh, kill that CIA agent who's not in it very yeah. long. Uh, this is all murders. And I think that, and then him saying, my friend was just murdered. Uh, why are you celebrating? Like he has moved past the, he's never been happy go lucky because everything's life or death and major cost and peril, but it's all part of the adventure and part of what you're trying to do. Now he's so vulnerable and now death has a personality to it because he lost his father uh, his dear friend Marcus, and then son. most importantly, his son. Yeah, that so suddenly death takes on a whole different thing, and I and I love the fact that they linger on the blood on his hands and the blood on the the telephone, very symbolic of he's lost communication with the world as well, and and with himself. And gosh, you're this is really becoming so therapeutic for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel like. You know, a lot of this is also, you know, getting him back into being Indiana Jones. Yeah. You know, a couple of things that really struck me that fit into this into this thread is how many times in these moments when he's brought back into this to the to the fold of of the chase, how many times does he go for help where the old Indiana Jones never would have? You mentioned the phone to call, you know, uh, the emergency 911 right. or whatever it was. That's that's a call for help. When he's in the streets before he gets on the horse, he goes to a police officer and he's like, yeah. those guys, those guys, Indiana Jones would have never done that. He right. was he was go like his old life was gone at that point. And going for help is not something that would be natural for him. So he decides to take things into his own hands by jumping onto the horse and does some pretty amazing things that I'd never thought I'd ever see a, a horse chase uh, do, but you're in a city. So you got to do a few things, but all of that, all of that just leads back to this, you know, we as an audience, really the writers, the director had to cope with the fact that we've got, We've got a character that's beloved. We need to give this character a final, you know, a final story. And so how do we do that without tr trying to trick or fake everybody? And I thought they did a brilliant job with that, with all of the things that we're talking about. He's a, he's a, he's a human being. He's a mortal man. Mm -hmm. But up to this point, we've always seen him as more than that. Yeah. He's never been human until this movie. Yeah. Even in his most vulnerable with Last Crusade, he's still, you know, he's still taking on uh, incredible challenges. I, I go on to move on to a different point, but Corey, you got something to say? Go ahead. No, I was just, I was going to move on to the next thing in, in the sense of just, you know, some of these other characters that lived on. I, I really liked uh, Phoebe Waller Bridge uh, mm -hmm. as Helena Shaw. I, I really liked her take because from the trailer, I thought, oh, he'll just be, she'll be the sidekick. Uh, looking to help Indiana's quest. And this was not the case at all. I actually love the twist in her character's uh, development and the fact that she was looking to make a buck and pay off some debts. Uh, and, and she was not nice about it. I mean, she is. she was definitely working against Indiana Jones. Uh, this was never, I mean, at, at times, obviously, they're back and forth working together and whatnot and have a relationship uh, throughout the movie. But I really liked this turn of character for her. Um, I felt made really unique uh, development for Indiana Jones. Like he didn't know whether to help her or uh, whether to work against her. And every, every point she was working with the villains, she, she quote told him them everything at one point. Uh, but yet she had unique ways to get out of a jam, uh, which was fun. Uh, and you always kind of rooting for her, but also like, what what what's, what are you playing out here? What's your end goal? Once you get what you want, what are you just gonna run off the sunset and leave him in the dust? And I felt like I felt that was the case sometimes. Uh, so I appreciated that a lot with her character and how she was in the story. Uh, you know, she was trying to manipulate him to begin with, but that he didn't take on to that. And so 
Uh, I really like this character a lot, um, and it was a standout for me. I liked her. I, I liked her as well after the movie. Everything you mm-hmm. said resonated with me after the movie. She really bothered me during the movie, which I again I I feel is how I was supposed to have felt. All mm-hmm. I kept going back to was her father was an archaeologist. She studied to be an archaeologist. She's known Indiana Jones her entire life. He has a he has a pet name for her. Pet name that sounds weird, but you know what I mean. He has a yeah, he has a yeah. childhood name nickname yeah. for her. I could I was really angry with her that the financial aspect of it was the most important thing to her. I was really upset when she betrays him in the first time we really have that conflict where they're in the the room with all the shelves with artifacts, I really was mad at her. And I just, I couldn't get over it until Hmm. after the movie. And now to hear your like take on her, it was, it was a very nice, uh, fresh view of like the, like you said, the sidekick, but wasn't it almost like anti sidekick, yeah. And, the, you know, she was the she was the villain, not villain of the movie. You know what? I If I before this film, if I was going to put money down on something that would have rubbed me the wrong way, it would have been Phoebe Waller Bridge. And. I completely would have been wrong. I would have lost all my money. <laughs> I loved her in this movie. I loved her yeah. in this movie. In many ways, it was her. It wasn't her story. But she was the main hero. She saves Indy more than he saves her. Yeah. And that at first I had a I wasn't sure how I felt about that because it isn't Indiana Jones movie. But again, his vulnerability is his strength, but it takes her to help him to see that. She becomes family to him in a way that he didn't necessarily think that he wanted or expected. And I think she would have said the exact same thing. It wasn't until they get together and she's trying to auction off the dial of destiny that their chemistry won me over. Like it was at that point. I'm like, okay, I'm really digging this. I really like their chemistry and she's so magnanimous. And I, yeah. you know, I, I, I didn't interview her, but I was at press conferences for solo and I've seen her in a lot of stuff and I know she's super talented, but I didn't expect to be charmed by her the way that I was. In fact, that whole sequence where she's trying to get, Indy the dynamite and and get him to light it with the cigarette yeah. and her trying to walk through and saw those clues. I thought that was a fantastic scene. And again, yeah. part of me was like, well, I want Indy to be the clever one, but that wasn't his story. He he's his pilot light is out. His pilot light is extinguished. Yeah. And hers is just uh getting started, and she helps to kind of ignite that in him, but it takes time. What other characters did you guys that stood out to you guys? <laughs> you know? Yeah. So I, I'm glad you said that, Corey, because I was about ready to say the 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 adopted boy. Uh-huh. Um, uh huh. Um, it's it's a, it's abundantly Teddy. 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 It's abundantly yeah. clear to people who know me through CWK <laughs> Pour Over that I generally don't I don't care for those types of characters that are that are the sidekick, but as children. But this character, I I liked. I you wish did. I, I did. I, I did. I wish there would have been a little bit more purpose and reason to why Teddy was in the movie, especially in the airplane scene. Yeah. I, I just she's like, can you fly that? And I didn't know why. I didn't know why he was supposed to fly that airplane. Obviously, until the very end, it's like, oh, OK, that's why. But it seemed to be kind of super, superfluous and purposeless until that point. But generally I really liked the roles that he played. I like his, his capture uh, scene. It seemed again, purposeful. He, he walked off by himself. He, you know, stole some money from kids that were kind of bullying him in the streets, got himself an ice cream and found himself into trouble. I just, I, I really liked that character, which completely surprised me. Yeah, I agree. I, I like Teddy. I think it, it was done well, but not overly done, uh, and not trying to be a short round, uh, and you know, and, and really just Mister Jones, Mister Jones, but not happening. Like I, I don't want it to happen that way. Um, 
but I did feel like he he, he had good placement. I, he was a good sidekick to um, uh, Helena, and, and knowing that they have a relationship there, they're kind of both grifters or uh, street kind of like pickpockets type people that like Aladdin. Them, yeah, I kind of like that. Yeah, exactly. So I thought it was it worked well, and um, although I. I in the scene where he's like, uh, he's the bouncer for the auction, which I thought was kind of funny, mm-hmm. uh, little kid. He's there like trying to play airplane. And I thought, okay, this is going to come back somehow. They're not going to destroy it here just for whatever reason. And it worked fine for me. I mean, the part I guess I didn't really totally understand was they're in the rain. It's like, this is this not an easy thing to do. I, I, it's just like, he's never flown before. Like, it's just like, I don't know. I guess I could have enjoyed that better, but then I guess you yeah, stretched imagination a little bit. I, I did. I did like the sleeping captain that was in there that eventually did help him out, kind of landing yeah. and whatnot. I think it was like, okay, this still this kind of works. You know, um, it's kind of a fun little uh, entertainment piece. But uh, overall, I, I did like this character as well. Um, and we get a short little scene, like you said, that little scene where he's in the crowd just hanging out, and these kids are bullying him, kind of making fun of him. He's wearing a straw hat, I guess. I don't know if that's what the case was, but um, he gets back by pickpocketing them and, and gets them ice cream. So, and I also felt like he was kind of like there in key moments that we need him to be there, and it, it didn't feel forced. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the scene where he's trying to put the dial together, he jumps on the and disrupts the interaction there and, and whatnot. So, I feel like it, it worked good, and I like the character. Uh, all you know, so, Teddy. So yeah, Teddy reminded me of Indiana Jones' relationship with Short Round. Boy, I really wanted a Kihu Kwan uh, cameo. Oh, man. In this, uh, for sure. But it reminded me of that. And we see Helena set, you know, indicates uh, a couple of times in the movie, you know, you, you're you my godfather. Uh, what does that even mean anyway, she says. But she feels very slighted that he wasn't in her life. And it, which uh, parallels with him not having his son to not having the option to be in his son's life. Uh, so I thought that was, that was smart. Again, I, I'm noticing the breadcrumbs that they put throughout this movie that they're really built to a, a, a glorious crescendo, which I didn't, I wasn't in impactfully aware of until a, a little bit more reflection. The side characters are interesting. It was great to see Sala back. I, I felt he was a little yeah. bit underused, um, but it would have been cool to see him with his older family instead of just with his grandchildren. But I understand that. Um, that part was fun. Uh, the Antonio Banderas character, he, he is, he is the, the sailor in this, it's of the frog man. And then he is kind of unceremoniously murdered as well, yeah. which I found that to be a little bit shocking. It would have been nice to get to see a little bit more of Antonio Banderas. He, he did play a great Zorro in that Zorro film. He did. Um, so it would have been great to see a little bit more of him, but, uh, all the, I guess the only reason to not use something like Katanga from Raiders of the Lost Ark is that we won't have to see him get murdered because I thought surely we're going to see him as the person on the boat. Um, oh, you know, right. The, the, who's him. in charge of them. That's right. Oh, well, either way, I, I want to talk where we are already kind of running long, but I think the, the Isle of Destiny deserves that. We didn't get like a major animal thing i mean you've got snakes you've got bugs the eels you've got rats uh you've got uh ants yes there was a, there was an eel sequence and i think that yeah, was what it was. was great but it wasn't anywhere near as long as any of the other previous animal ones we saw we got to see a little well, bit of bugs three minutes underwater remember three minutes yeah but it wasn't <sighs> and by the way if you that's not really how the bins works by the way i am a, i am actually a licensed scuba diver well, it was, but it was 1969 it was, so I don't yeah know. that's that's true. <laughs> things are different <laughs> then. so yeah there, there was there the eel thing was fun but the underwater cinematography was challenging because it was hard to tell Kind of what was going on, and maybe that's yeah. sort of adds to semi realism. To be that way, I think. I guess, but I guess I don't really want realism in my Indiana Jones action, which leads me to <laughs> okay. Uh, if people complained about nuking the fridge, uh, mm. we've got a new, we've got it, which I never had a problem with. What do we think about the big twist at the end where <sighs> not only do they go back in time, but they go back to uh, before Christ, they go back to I think it's the Trojan War. Um, and, uh, what do we think about this twist and, um, Indiana Jones's, uh, 
kind of come was, to come to Jesus moment. It was uh, the the siege of Syracuse. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting. You mentioned Tony Banderas getting shot and killed it was kind of a shock or whoa. Because I think throughout this movie, you're wondering what is Indiana Jones' fate, right? And we're all wondering it. What's going to happen? What's what? what are they, how are they going to end this? What is he going to you know? Is he going to die? I think there's a good amount of peril in this film. I feel like maybe he's going to you know go on one last you know hurrah and then flame out and and you know take one for the team or something maybe to do a heroic moment. We don't know. Uh, people, multiple people are getting shot. He gets shot, which I was like, wow, okay, they're shooting him. Um, and then also we, you know the sequence. And I I will say. This was a wonderful piece of time travel. I really enjoyed the way this worked. It worked for me, and the fact that it didn't work, uh, and the fact that the the they got the time wrong and the continental drift. I was like, "That's perfect! What a great way to foil the villain!" But also just by the content of like not using mathematics, but history. Indiana Jones is using history for his win. Uh, and the fact that like th- that was great, so fantastic, and they showed up. I love that they flew through there, and it was open sky. What a great cinematic piece! Uh, and I just mm. felt like that was just a really nice way to do time travel without all the wang and boom and bop. It was just like there's no you know technology involved other than, other than the dial directing them, uh, and it, it was great. The reserve I have is when they they get crash and they meet. Um, uh, Archimedes. Archimedes, thank yeah. you. I was like, that was a little surreal in the sense of like, he wants to stay there. I was like, but why? Is it because he has nothing else left back in the current 1969? I guess that's what he says, mm-hmm. you know. But he does. Marion's still back there and whatnot. And that sequence where she kind of tries to get him to figure it out and, and punches him and he goes, knocks out cold and then wakes up in the bed. I was like, that's the only part I didn't feel worked a whole lot for me. It just felt like it was just a jarring ending. Like if I was reading an end of a book, this is the wrap up sequence. And I wanted some more meat on the bone. Um, hmm. You know, did he really reconcile with himself or did he feel he got slighted uh, by getting taken back to his current timeline? Um, I don't know. I, he does make reparations with, with Marion. You know, I think it was great sequence. Um, but I think there could be more there. Um, and maybe there was, and they just didn't, they cut it, but, um, it just felt like kind of a easy way out rather than try to, to totally huh. pass everything. Interesting. I thought it was the least easiest way out. It was uh, very, I know what you're saying though. I know what you're saying. I see. Tom, okay. Tom, what do you think? Yeah. I, okay. So I don't want this to be taken the wrong way. I, I was ready for a quick wrap at that point. Um, mm-hmm. I didn't, I, I felt like it, 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 anything else probably would have belabored it at Agreed. that point. You're, Agreed. you've been sitting in the theater for almost with, with, uh, yeah. with trailers and everything. You've been sitting there almost two two forty. Uh, by that point I was, I was good with that as a conclusion. It had sort of that kind of silly Indiana Jones esque kind of like, rap with the you know a punch <laughs> in the face and now things are going to be different um the to to the point of going back in time Corey, 100 percent everything you said I, I i didn't think this would actually happen when he screamed abort abort i was like okay that yeah. so we might have gone there but we didn't but when it did and when they i just i love that sequence where indy kept saying you didn't take into account. It was almost like he was senile in that moment. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and, the, and he's like, you're, you're wrong. We're going to, and when they came through and they thought they were in the battle of Normandy or what, whichever battle it was in world war II, they wanted to be in. And then they take a closer look and their sails. And those aren't bombs. Yeah. Those are catapult flaming catapult, you know, uh, uh, missiles. I, I loved that. I wasn't sh- like my, my mind was doing a, a check and balance at that moment. Cause mm-hmm. I was like, is this too much? What I had been waiting for the entire time was that in last crusade where the plane, the, Indy's on the motorcycle with his dad and the plane mm-hmm. crashes and skids through the oh. tunnel and they look oh. at him and the pilot looks and it's just sort of a silly yeah. moment. Yeah. I, we hadn't gotten there yet. 
So the checks and balances, my brain went, we haven't had silly yet. So going back in time, this is kind of silly Indiana Jones, but it ended up not being that because of the meeting, because of the conversation, because of uh, Indy's really peril uh, moment of leave me. I have nothing. There's nothing left for me. But we that it also, Dan, I love the way you use the term breadcrumbs throughout the movie. That was foreshadowed for us mm. because they took that second look at Archimedes' um, uh, tomb, tomb yeah. and they noticed propellers on yeah. what the griffin or something, and, and the they watch. noticed the watch. And so you, I don't know, no. I, I figured it was the other way that Archimedes had gone to the future. I and thought come that back. too. Yeah. What a great little twisty play there that 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 that's how that came about so it totally worked for me even though in my brain at the moment i was like i don't know about this but it's it works so well again complicated Corey, go ahead it is well done i have one more thought too in that moment where he says i want to stay uh with archimedes and, and this is where i belong i thought okay the the body they found was Indiana Jones. I thought he found his own tomb. I was like, "Oh, that would be I, interesting." Do I want this twist? Do I do I want like I was kind of coming in the theater. I was like, "I don't know if I can handle this." Like, if it, it feels like a like a I don't know a, a cop out or something. I don't. know. It's just like I'm glad they didn't do that. Maybe that was maybe one thing they talked about when when reviewing the script. But I was like, that would have been really strange because remember he talks about the kid still his watch. He's like, that's my father's watch. I was like, did he just find his own watch? He realizes this. Then he, you know what I'm saying? Like he knows it's him, but it's not, he's not going to tell anybody type thing. Um, maybe that was one thread, but boy, that would have been one heck of an ending. Um, you know, that would have been interesting. I'm glad that didn't happen, but it would have been interesting. I think so, yeah. I think it would have been incredibly disappointing too. Cause after I think so all too. These I think it would have felt like he just, faded out i think that is the challenge this uh i was talking to scott actually after this movie yeah and i said boy seeing indiana jones is like this like old guy walking around his boxers and uh being vulnerable and and um i i had said for crystal skull indiana jones almost never struggles in crystal skull he's pretty flawless throughout the whole thing He's at the peak. So now we kind of get the opposite. So then it begs the question, do I want my Indiana Jones to be vulnerable? Is that the kind of hero that we have? It's certainly not the hero we've ever had. This is a new character. It's the same character. This is an evolution. It's a maturity. It's a sophistication in the storytelling through a very uh, able craftsman and an able storyteller. But is is that what I what I expected? No. Does that make it bad? No, it doesn't. I, I like complexity. I think um, when, when I was seeing them go actually go back that far back in time, I thought there was a part of me that, oh, no, I'm going to hear complaints about this for the rest of my life on social media. Huh. Um, because it was such a, such a stretch. And the fact that he had given up that much that he wanted to stay back in history and not even realize – how he's going to mess up time. It was at that moment. I thought, yeah, I've got time travel fatigue. I'm sick of time travel. Like stop. Yeah. Okay. We already yeah. got it with a DeLorean that you should have stopped there. Uh, <laughs> you know, we've seen it in a lot of other movies and Marvel movies, all kinds of stuff. And it's fine. It's an, it's an effective plot device. Uh, I was so disheartened, not discouraged or mad, but disheartened. And he had given up that much. And he's like, what what do I have to live for? And I thought, oh my gosh, this man truly has given up. This is the guy. This is Indiana Jones. Indiana Jones is the most tenacious, yeah. determined, focused. I mean, he gives the Terminator a bad name. He does not give up. He gave up. He gave up through this whole movie. So this is what Scott and I are talking about. Do I want to see a vulnerable Indiana Jones that's given up on life? Because that's what I got. That's what I got in this movie until yeah. the very end. And the more I think about it, the more I think it's beautiful. But I, I also understand that it's a bit of a risk. And I'm good with that. The humor part that you mentioned, this movie is the least humorous of any of the films. Even it Temple is. of Doom, for all of its darkness, has got some actual screwball, yeah. Three Stooges level comedy stuff. Even to the point where a hammer falls on the way and makes the bonking noise. Boink. 
yeah. language makes me kind of go. This movie isn't really funny. Even the quips aren't really funny. Mm-hmm. Helena is the scene stealer. Um, so these are all things I'm very aware of. But I, I mentioned this earlier. The reunion with Marion uh, and their honest conversation, uh, com- coupled with him confessing on that boat about what he would go back in time and change yeah. about not having his son go to war. How do you know if it would work? Well, he would be alive. Uh, and then their reunion together. I cried. Like I didn't get tears. I like, I cried and hearing this, the sweeping Marion theme that was so beautiful. Um, and I thought, well, how are they going to end this? Because in every Indiana Jones movie, there's a cool hat moment and there's some serious hero moments. We never really got a hero shot we didn't get that breathtaking oh here mm-hmm. he is in the outfit uh him kind of grabbing the head at the end with the little circle at the end almost felt a tad bit out of place tonally from the rest of the film because we there was there was more lighthearted than anything and it was like at the end when everything he built and maybe that's the point maybe it's to be like okay he's got his spirit back but he's also done with the adventure i don't know Sal even says you're back you're back right and Marin's like are you back and he is back, and we know because he grabs the hat off of a shadow. Yeah. Is that enough for a character that we've loved since 1981? Be- I don't know. know. I, I thought about this, too. What kind of send-off do I want for Indiana Jones? Do I want him to, to take that opt-out and, and go out the, out the route of the hero, you know, right off of the sunset type thing? What do I want? And they gave me what I wanted. He pulls the hat off the, the clothesline, which, again, is a great little little. I loved how it zoomed in, and we just, I mean, I know it's coming. I think the hat's there. He grabs it. I think it's in my cute, head, he's always going to be on an adventure. He's always, he's right now, he's on an adventure. I we hope don't not. Heard of yet. I yeah. think he is. I, I he, he, he goes, I think through, he's like, done. I think his adventure now is to settle in and love his wife. Well, yes, but I mean, like, that's, and an if, if there is another adventure, right? I think that the whole movie was a waste. No, but I'm saying, I'm not saying that, but I'm saying, like, he's ready for that next adventure. Uh, I think that the spark is back alive and he thought he lost it. You know, obviously losing his friends, his father, uh, his son, and, and, and things were crumbling for him. His job like was, he was dormant. But, you think but I dormant like, is a good well, I like to think that like mm-hmm. my hero, India Jones, is still out there doing uh, an adventure. And whether that's being married to Marion and going out and getting groceries, that's an adventure for him. You know, he, he's looking at that aspect because if you look at the early in the, in the film, he was going to work. He was going to you know the retirement thing that wasn't an adventure for him. It was just steps through life. Mm-hmm. Um, so mm-hmm. I think he's got that spark of adventure back in his in his system. I think the dormancy is is the term I would use for him. And I think that his greatest adventure is the one he's about to take, and that's healing and healing his marriage and healing himself. And again, that is a very mature concept for an Indiana Jones movies, which are largely wonderful, exciting live action cartoons. I mean, really, they are, uh, except for some elements of Crystal Skull, and this one is is not that at all. But I no. but I applaud them for doing it. I I'm, I want to really wrap this thing up because we've gone long, but I'm fine with that because it's such a, a terrific topic of conversation with with two two masters. I'm happy to be sharing a cup of coffee with both of you. So why don't we give our letter grades and final thoughts on this film, Tom? Why don't you start? Um. You know, I it's changed as we've had this conversation because I gave it a solid A prior. I I, I bump it to an A plus. I just think this was a marvelous fun it was a fun movie, but very thought provoking and fit fit where I am in life. You know, this mm-hmm. this character, this movie grew with me. Mm-hmm. I mean, for heaven's sakes, I was 14, 13 years old when this movie came out, and here I'm 53. And, and, and this is the Indiana Jones that my, my eye today can relate to. Mm. Um, I'm with you on all the things you say about the age and did you want your hero to be vulnerable? Well, quite frankly, that's kind of how I feel too. Mm-hmm. I feel like the circling of the hat at the very end is a wink and a nod to us. But when we talk about adventure, you're both right in the sense that Corey, yes, he's starting a new adventure and Dan, you're right that his new adventure is, is domesticated, but he knows one way to do it. And that is by putting that hat on and approaching (laughs) it with the confidence that he knows he can. Well, that's a beautiful way to say it. 
So I just think, I think this, this conversation moved it to an A plus my, my final, my final thoughts are, are, it's just going to be this after the movie, after the, the, the hats pulled, it's dropped credits come up. You get his main theme song blasted in your face. Yeah. And that kind of said, that didn't sound quite right. You get the theme song very clearly crystal clear right there. And I sat back and I just listened to it. Mm-hmm. I listened to it like I would never hear it again. Mm-hmm. And when when the, the song gets to a point and then it just punches back to the to the main theme, dun, 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 I turned to Scott and I said, I could listen to this all day long. I could listen to this theme song all day long. Mm-hmm. And what more do we need for Indiana Jones than that John Williams theme? It just it's poetic. Corey. Yeah, I mean, I love talking to you guys about this stuff because it, it helps me really come to grips with this film. Not that I have problems with it, but it's just a cathartic. Uh, you know, what worked? What didn't work? Why, why did this happen? You know, just different aspects of perspective and, and maybe not always seeing eye to eye. Dan, I'm really appreciative of you that you just – had problems with this be- to begin with, and 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 it's okay. I think it's good to talk through. It's cathartic, and 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 doing so. And and we've done we've done a lot with a lot of these films, and it's just it raises the overall love for the film I do have, and just movies in general. I just lo- love and talking about this. This is what the show is about. Coffee. It's going to sitting in a coffee shop with friends, talking about great movies, and just enjoying the perspectives we have. Um, and this again. It's sad that this is the last film we'll see of Indiana Jones, but I'm okay. I think it really, it did cement this is the character um, and this is the way it's going to be type thing. And and I think the overall film was fantastic. Um, I'm going to give it a, a solid A um, only because it's up against the other Indiana Jones movies. And my favorite movie of all time is Raiders of the Lost Ark. And that movie is mm. a perfect movie. Um and it can't beat itself. So um, I'm going to go, I'm going to go a, uh, because I, I think I also think even through this conversation, I need to see it again, just to kind of like, I think we see it when we're trying to intake all these things at once and just really analyze everything to, you know, to the nth degree and not just enjoying it for what it is. Now seeing a second time, I can sit back and go, okay, let me just sit back as a um, viewer and watch this one more time. I remember when I first saw the force awakens, I was, I was, it was challenging for me at the end yeah. of because, well, as I've said many times, uh, the big twist was ruined for me. Nothing was ruined for oh, me on yeah. this one, but I, I just, I am very confident that a second viewing is going to do wonders for me. That being said, uh, it's an A plus for me because cool. even though there are certain things that are challenging, um, I like, I need to be challenged. I'm still not sold at Indiana Jones. Um, for the very last one needs to suddenly be challenging, but uh, you know, in a very less important way, the last Halloween film uh, is people had similar problems because of the major changes they did to that franchise too. This wasn't a major change. This was a maturity. This was a growing up. This was um, an awakening of, of what it means to be not a hero, but what it means to be a man uh, and what it means to age with grace and dignity and, not just sort of rest on the success of your younger self, but to Mm. embrace loss and embrace love of self and family. And that's, that's pretty mature, complicated stuff. Um, It it does it in a more mature way than the last Jedi did. And in a more uh, less obvious way, but, but a, a terrific way. And, I haven't said this yet, but Mason loved this movie. I oh yeah. Oh, when I came down here earlier uh, to get ready, I he didn't know I could hear him, but he was talking to his mom about how cool Harrison Ford is and <laughs> how the great scenes he was laying laying them out play by play. And I just thought, my gosh, uh, Mason was born the same on the same birth date as Raiders of the Lost Ark, hmm. June twelfth, and it's my hmm. favorite movie. And then. Now he is seeing with me on the big screen an Indiana Jones film. And I, what could be better than that? 
listening to Coffee with Kenobi. You are with Dan Z, the podcast you're looking for. This is... <laughs> I'm so happy. I can't wait to revisit this again. Obviously, I can't wait to talk to you two knuckleheads uh, in the future. Uh, thank you both so much for uh, staying up late to enjoy a coffee late at night. I'll uh, just talk yeah. about Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. Tom, please let everybody know about Teachers in the Dungeon and where they can find you. Absolutely. You can catch me on Twitter at Draftline. And then, as you mentioned, Teachers in the Dungeons, our podcast. Speaking of adventure, Indiana Jones Adventure, Dungeons and Dragons Adventure. It's all great times. So Teachers in the Dungeon, you can find us, uh, our podcast on, you know, any podcast catcher. But on Twitter, we are at Dungeon Teachers. On Instagram and Facebook, we are Teachers in the Dungeon. And Corey, what about you? Yeah, uh, I'm breaking my Indiana Jones Twitter fast. I can make it back online now that we've seen the <laughs> film, which is great. Uh, I, you can check me out there at Corey Club. And uh, if you've got more thoughts around where you would go, uh, use the dial of destiny back in time. Let me know. Uh, Corey or Corey, oh gosh, Corey C at coffeewithkobe.com. This podcast is not endorsed by the Walt Disney Company or Lucasfilm Limited. It is intended for entertainment and informational purposes only. The official Star Wars website can be found at www.starwars.com. Star Wars, all names, sounds, and any other Star Wars-related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Disney and their respective trademark and copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Coffee with Kenobi unless otherwise indicated. This is the podcast you're looking for.